Okay, let's get started here. I want to talk about, uh, I just want to run through some ac activities, some examples uh, for single mean hypothesis tests. There's three examples and I just want, want to run through them all step by step. And I'm probably going to do more steps than most people would do in general, just to try and make sure we cover all the bases. So let's get started here. Uh, let's see. So I'll take this first one here. The way all the images are Creative Commons licensed and okay for redistribution. Um, by other people, so I'm not stealing people's content. <clears throat> Manufacturer of flashlight suspects that the new process, so the way they're manufacturing their lights, has reduced the amount of time that the lights, that the flashlights will last with a given set of batteries or something like that, something nice and quality controlled. With the old process, we know what the mean was, so maybe they collected data for years, and they know that the, the mean was 653.2 hours with a standard deviation of 28.9 hours. Now they've taken a random sample after the process changed, uh, and with this random sample of 40 flashlights, you don't want to take too many because you're destroying your product, right? The flashlight lasts only 645.1 hours before it conks out. So has the new process reduced flashity, flashlight longevity with alpha of 0.05? So let's see if we can write down as much as you can about this situation before I go to any future slides. Write down everything you think you need to know to do a hypothesis test. Moving on, this is my suggested uh, process for doing hypothesis tests, and that's what we're going to follow here. But before we do that, I just want to do a little quick check. Sample point estimate is 645.1 hours, or we could say that the point estimate is the z-score of that, but we'll get to that later, because that's the sample mean. And the sampling distribution of the mean or of the sample estimate is all possible sample means from n equal to 40 and the mean of that distribution is the same as the null hypothesis mean at least for this test we assume that the null hypothesis is true and so the sampling distribution that we will use will be a sampling distribution that has a mean of the uh, according to the null hypothesis implied by the null hypothesis so in this case it's the old process mean so we want to reject that hypothesis. The null hypothesis is going to be the old process is still happening, essentially, that there's been no change. So the standard error of that distribution is going to be the standard deviation of our, of our scores, which is 28.9 hours, divided by the square root of the sample size, square root of 40. So it ends up being about four and a half hours. So the hypotheses here. So right up here, you can see up here in the corner, I'm trying to kind of track. We're up in the right hypothesis. Uh, step. In words, we could say the average flashlight longevity has not changed, so there's been no change. So it's still the old process, it's still the same old, or it's the same as the old process. We have the same mean. And alternative hypothesis, it was clearly a directional hypothesis as it was said in the text, so go back through the video and look at that if that's not making sense to you. The average longevity has reduced, it's gotten smaller, it's gotten less, anything you want to say like that. So in symbols, we could say uh, I put new as the subscript. I didn't know exactly what to say, but new. So the mean from which our sample came is what we always mean here. The population mean from which we took our sample actually has a mean of, of the old process mean, 653.2 hours. And the alternative hypothesis, there's a less than there, that our sample actually comes from a population that has a lower mean than that. So longevity has reduced. Here's the diagram that you should be drawing. Now I use a computer to draw a diagram because it's easier than drawing by hand on a computer. Uh, this is a negative tailed hypothesis, so a one tailed on the negative side hypothesis because the old distribution is gonna have a mean of 650 something and our sample had a lower mean than that. And we are interested, well, it's actually not about the sample, it's about our hypothesis. We're interested in whether the process has created fewer hours on average, like a reduced longevity. So we're looking on the lower side of the sampling distribution of means here. And since we know that alpha is 0.05, we can look up um, the place where we get closest to 5% of 5% uh, of the uh, scores in any normal distribution, 5% uh, of the tail in the lower end. Boy, I'm just spazzing out here a bit today. And that's going to be 1.64, 1.65. I choose to go with 1.65 usually. In R, you can get this pretty quickly with the Q norm function. You can just type in Q norm and in parentheses 0 0.05 or just 0 0.05 that doesn't need the leading zero. So R is kind of handy as a table like that. So this is what we're looking at here with our diagram. We add our Z critical there. 
So we know the z that we have to beat, and then we're going to calculate our z observed as the next step and see if it is more extreme than that. So the z observed is the nice, handy, all-in-one formula. So it just bundles in the formula down here for the standard error of the mean, because that's the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. And that's where you get the z-score. The z-score is for a sample mean. And so it has to come from a distribution of means. So that's the standard deviation of the distribution of means. So we plug in our values here and reduce it a bit. Now you can calculate this yourself and see if you can come up with the right answer. I came up with a Z observed of negative 1.77. Feel free to let me know if I've messed up on my math because I don't always get everything uh, perfectly the first time through. So redoing this thing with a little function I wrote in R, it has lots of extra information on it. Don't be thrown off by that. I just wanted to see the raw score values right along with the Z score value of the sampling distribution according to the null hypothesis. I wanted to see both of those things together. We find um, our Z observed is here, and our Z critical is a little to the right of that. So our Z observed, well, you can make your own decision. Should we reject the null hypothesis or not? You can look at p-value, and that should tell you also. Yes, we should reject the null hypothesis. Um, and we can say it's because the absolute value of Z observed is greater than the absolute value of Z critical, and the difference is in the right direction. So with a one-tailed test, you can't just say, is the absolute value of Z observed greater than the absolute Z critical? Because what if you have a big negative Z observed, but you were supposed to find differences in the positive direction, right? So you have to include both of those with one, one tail tests. Or you can just say the observed falls in the reflection region. That's an easier way to say it. You can just say P is less than alpha. Because if you look back, P was 0.3 something, and alpha is 0.05. So there we go. So in conclusion, we can say, the new process does produce flashlights with a shorter average light. Now, I highlighted does, but you wouldn't in a research report. That seems a little histrionic for researchers. And then I would put the Z statistic of our sample estimate, and I would put P, whether it is less than or greater than our alpha level, and I would put the alpha level there. So here's a question that you can work out for yourselves. What would the result of that test be if we had done a two-tailed test at alpha 0.05? instead of a one-tailed test. I'm not going to work through that, but feel free to do it yourselves. It's a really good exercise to see how little you can change and still come up with the answers. It's a good exercise to see if you can not start from scratch, but just go back through your work and see where you have to start changing things and where those, those changes have implications. So, next activity. The BDI-2, it's the Beck Depression Inventory 2nd Edition. It's a screening questionnaire, just a brief questionnaire with uh, a couple dozen questions on it. And it's pretty good for checking to see if a person should get further screening for depression. Um, and people use it in research to try and kind of estimate depression levels in large groups of individuals. So it has a population mean, as we saw in class, in Dutch individuals of 10.6 with a standard deviation of 10.9. And let's assume that that's, relevant, that's normal enough. So a sample of 87 Dutch teenagers, I'm making this part up, who listen to emo music is given this, this little test here. Um, I don't know why we're getting this business. Okay, are we back online here? Okay. And so our question is, do the emo teenagers have a different level of depressive, depressive symptomatology than the population as a whole? And our alpha will be 0 0.05. So let's say we find that our sample from the teenagers is a BDI score mean of 9.3. So work out as much of this as you can. In fact, do the entire hypothesis test if you can. Get all the way through and, you know, beginning to end, do all the steps. Pause this video until you're done and then continue. If you're just watching these videos and kind of absorbing the information, you're not learning as much as you could. You're learning a tiny fraction of what you could be doing. The first time you see one of these problems that you have to work out yourself should not be the first time you're staring at it on an exam. You want to do you know, a couple of dozen of these or more and make sure you're getting them right five, ten times in a row with no mistakes before you see them on an exam. And that's the way you'll make sure you do it right. So moving on, hoping that you've already got your answers here. By the way, that's not that any of the Jonas Brothers or anybody else. It's just some Dutch kid that I found a photo of. So here's the steps I recommend. The sample point estimate is the sample mean, 9.3 on the BDI2 scale. The sampling distribution is the distribution of all possible sample mean from whatever population this came from, um, with a sample of n equals 87. And since we're doing a null hypothesis test, we assume that this sample came from a population that had 
the null hypothesis implied mean for the mean of the general population, which is 10.6. So we're testing to see whether it's different from that. So whatever we're testing against, that's the null hypothesis mean. The standard error is this little formula, standard deviation, which was 10.9 divided by square root of 87. So our, our hypotheses here in words would be like this, the Dutch emo teams have an average have average BDI2 scores or have BDI2 scores that are on average the same as the Dutch population. Um, and then alternative, they're not the same. You have to come up with some way to say that without implying the directionality because this is a non-directional hypothesis. It's a two-tailed hypothesis. So our null hypothesis is that the emo teens come from a population with a mean of 10.6. You might also write mu of emo equals mu of Dutch population or something like that, as long as you somewhere indicate what that Dutch population mean is, so we have the number there. And then the alternative hypothesis is just that the emo mean is not the same. Emo mean, sounds funny. So here's my, uh, my little diagram. I put the two tails in different colors. I don't know why the software, I chose to do that that, that time. Anyway, you don't have to do that. I shaded in the tails. So we've got 0.025 in each area because alpha is 0.05. It's a two-tailed hypothesis, so we divide alpha in two pieces. And looking up our z-score, which if you need to, at this point you might be starting to have dreams about the number 1.96. So I look in the negative z-table and I find that the area below that of 0.025 corresponds with a z-score of negative 1.96. So our z-scores are going to be plus and minus 1.96. Or in R, you could say Q norm 0.025. That'll give you the number. So we put our plus and minus 1.96 here. Now we already know that the mean is going to be lower, that the, the 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 Dutch emo mean is lower than the Dutch population mean. So why are we doing these two tails? Well, because we set up the hypothesis with two tails before we know what the mean is. Oh, maybe I should restructure these examples for that. But you have to live, live and die by that. You can't change your process as you're going because it actually changes the probabilities and your p-values will be wrong. And we don't like p-values to be wrong. That's, that's statistical hell and burning forever. So calculating the z observed, as you've seen before, we just plug in values to that nice little formula. And we find negative 1.11. Yeah, we can look at that and say that's not good. It needed to be outside the range of negative 1.96 to positive 1.96, right? So this is the situation we've got here. Not good. Now I drew on all the P areas. You don't need to do that. All you need to do is say Z observed is between these numbers. It should be outside these numbers to reject the null hypothesis. It's not. But technically what's going on is all the area above this Z observed and below its and or sorry, below the Z observed and above its mirror image on the other side of the normal distribution. That's the P value, which is pretty big, 0.27 almost. So uh, yeah. We're not rejecting that null hypothesis here. Not even close. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis because the observed is not as great in, in uh, value as Z critical. The Z observed falls outside the rejection region, so it's not in the rejection region, or is greater than the alpha. And our conclusion might be something like Dutch emo teens do not apparently have different BDI2 scores compared to Dutch citizens in general. Z equals negative 1.11. P is greater than 0.05. It hurts to write P is greater than 0.05 after you've been doing this for a while. You're like, oh, couldn't even get P is 0.05. Jeez, what kind of lousy researcher am I? So I hope you had some fun with that one. This is the last one for this example. Activity number five. Standard Roman pattern of funerary inscription. I'm making all this up, except that people do study funerary inscriptions. I know this from people I live with. Um, and they use that to estimate how much influence um, like the Romans had at different periods in different parts of the empire or the edges of the empire. So I made all these numbers up. So let's say the standard Roman pattern of funerary inscription is found on an average of 92.7% of tombstones per cemetery. So one cemetery might have 50%, one might have 100%, one might have 83%, et cetera. But the average is 92% per cemetery, cemetery during the late empire period with a standard deviation of 12.3%. That's the variability of, of that. And my wife's standing right beside me, and I'm conscious that I don't know if there's such a thing as a late empire period. <laughs> late imperial. Oh, late imperial. Okay, good. Now I know. So archaeologists count the tombstones in ancient Roman cemeteries in 36 villages from this period um, that were excavated in Turkey, which was at various points parts of the Roman Empire, as I understand it. And they find that the average percentage in this region of Roman inscriptions it, it per, to, per uh, cemetery is only 87.1% per cemetery. So 
again, one cemetery might have you know, 96%, one cemetery might have 64%, but the average percentage is 87.1% of Roman inscriptions per cemetery. So is there evidence of waning Roman influence? Because this is what they started out with, not because they're looking at their mean being lower, but they started out, I need to rewrite these <laughs> so they're doing good science. Uh, they, they were wondering if the Roman Empire was waning in its influence, if its influence was reducing in this region of Turkey during this, the late imperial period, which now I know is a thing. And they want to be really sure they're right before they start spouting this off to their colleagues who can be a bit viciously sarcastic when you're wrong. I'll say it's point of one. So moving on here, here's my recommended um, sequence that we're going to follow. So the sample point estimate is 87.1%. Now percent is fine, it's a ratio measurement. There are, if you get into fancy, funkier stats, there you should treat percentages and proportions in certain ways. But for this test, you can say percents are just numbers. 87 out of 100, you know, it's just fine. You can just treat that as a percent for this example here. So the sampling distribution is all possible sample mean from n equals 36. And the mean of the sampling distribution, so we're assuming that they randomly sampled 36 of the many, many villages in Turkey in that region during that time period. The mean of this distribution has to be the null hypothesis implied mean. So that's 92%. So what we're saying is that if the null hypothesis is correct, then all the village, let's say there are hundreds of villages in Turkey from that period, that all of them, if you looked at the percentage of Roman inscriptions in all their cemeteries, the average inscription percentage per cemetery is the average percentage of tombstones per cemetery that have Roman inscriptions is the same as the average that they got from previous study from the rest of the Roman Empire, right? So it's 92%. But the alternative hypothesis is that it's going to be actually lower here. So it's where did this 87.1% sample come from? Is it just kind of a low estimate that came from a, a, a population with a mean of 92%? Or did it come from a population that actually has a lower mean than 92%? For the standard error, we just apply our little formula and we find that it's 2.05%. So in words, our hypotheses might be cemeteries in this region had an average of 92% of tombstones with the standard pattern, or they had an average of fewer than 92% with the standard pattern. So we've got a one-tailed test set up here. So in symbols, mu equals 92% or mu equals less than 92%. So mu of this region of Turkey during this time period. I didn't put any subscripts, so I think you're kind of getting it here. Here's my diagram. You don't have to draw the Roman tombstone. So we have alpha equals 0.01, and we put all of that in one tail, and to find out what the cutoff value is there, we look in our Z table, and we find the closest thing to 0.01, and we find 0.0099. That's associated with a Z of negative 2.33. In R, you could say Q norm 0.01, and that would give you the same thing, actually to greater specificity rounding. So this is our diagram. We've got our critical z value listed there at negative 2.33. So moving on with the calculation, now we calculate the observed z value and see how that's going to fit in our diagram. So plugging in our values here, the difference between our sample mean and the null hypothesis mean divided by the standard error, we get negative 2.39. That's looking pretty good. So negative 2.33 was the number to beat to reject the null hypothesis and our observed value is negative 2.39. So that gives us a p-value of less than 0.01. And the computer tells us it's 0.0084. Not that you need to know that. You just need to know it's less than 0.01. So without a computer, you can just say z observed is further away from the mean than z critical. Therefore, we reject the null hypothesis. So we reject because of the same things as before. Same reasons. And something, some people would say it boils down to p is less than alpha. And that's maybe one way to think of it. I always I think that the P and the alpha are just shorthand ways to indicate how far something is from the center of the distribution. In conclusion, uh, the inscriptions show evidence of waning Roman influence, and you could be more operational if you wanted to. You could say there seems to be a, a lower percentage of Roman pattern inscriptions per cemetery in this region than in the standard estimate that we have from the full population of the Roman Empire during that time period. And you put Z equals negative 2.3 p is less than 0.01. Working all your variables correctly and accurately into these conclusion statements is kind of difficult. It's harder than it looks, so I'm going to make you guys do this uh, for some homeworks, definitely. Probably the very next homework. We're all done with that um, set of examples, and the next one is going to be all about power.